everybody. Welcome to Exploring Nighttime Nature. My name is Chris Safa and I'm going to be talking with you today about Marvelous Moths and Moth Night, which is something we celebrate every summer in the Wissahickon Valley. So people ask me, how did you ever get interested in moths? So it started when I was a girl and we had a, a composting garden and organic habitat in our backyard. There were bat houses and bird houses and then one day I found a Luna moth. And have you ever found, have you ever seen a real Luna moth? It is absolutely beautiful. And it was so stunning that it started me on a lifetime adventure of moths and butterflies. I ran in the house, got my little golden book. And yes, I found what little there was to learn about moths, which is pretty much all there was. And there wasn't much about it anywhere. So then I started studying it. And now of course we have the internet and millions of resources and everything is different. And now I'm a Pennsylvania Master Naturalist. I'm a commissioner on the Parks and Recreation Commission. So take a look at this moth on the right. My nephew Michael just sent me this photo and this moth just emerged in the Wissahickon Park on May 1st. So she's drying her wings and resting and pumping out pheromones which is the sexy smell that will lure her mate to her. She only lives one or two days. And on the left is a male luna moth, which you can't really see, but he has much bigger feathery antennas. And that's what he's gonna to use to find her. So we don't see moths that much. That's what's so fun about moth night. So take a look at this picture. Is that a hummingbird? Oh, it's a hummingbird moth but it looks like a hummingbird. And it's one of the few day flying moths that we can see. So if something flies in the daytime, what is it called? Diurnal. Of course, most moths fly at night, that's nocturnal. And then your big SAT word you can show off later with is called crepuscular, which means something that flies at twilight. So see this photo? I have my moth trap set with a mercury vapor light. And as darkness falls, the moths wake up and go forth to nectar on plants and pollinate things and to mate and to have their nighttime fun. So uh, the reason moths have bigger furrier bodies is because it's cold at night and they have to keep themselves warm. So while you're sleeping, there are 10 times more moths flying in your garden in the park or anywhere that you have a plant or you see anything nectar. If you see a butterfly nectaring on a plant during the day, at night, there's more insects there that are called moths. So there's 160,000 species of moths and only 7,500 species of butterflies. So why do moths matter? For three reasons. <laughs> They're great pollinators, right? Bees are good pollinators. Bats are good pollinators butterflies and lots of other insects, but moths are too. So here's an interesting moth. It's the giant sphinx moth and his proboscis, which is a curling tongue, you remember this from science class, can reach 14 inches into a specialized orchid in Africa. So I love that balance, right? The insect needs the orchid and the orchid needs the insect. So uh, they're also a good food source. You know, uh, moths spend most of their lives in uh, caterpillar state, right? And there's nothing more delicious to a bird than a delicious protein packed caterpillar. So you can see this bluebird is enjoying a caterpillar. And we're grateful to the FOW for building and installing all these bluebird boxes all up, you know, in the meadows and the parks. So the bluebirds are there and the swallows. So moths are bio indicators. So you probably remember in this uh, 18th century, people would take canaries into the coal mine. It's kind of morbid, but they're very sensitive to environmental changes. So if there's too high a level of methane gas, which is deadly, sadly the canary would expire, but the humans would have a chance to run to the surface and live. So as you can see in the chart down at the bottom, you know, we do bat night, moth night, bird walks, butterfly counts, and all the things we're doing as the years go by, it seems like every species is dropping in number. And that is telling us something important. So moths are food source for birds, bats, and more. Oh, and who's this? So I set the moth trap in the summertime at twilight 
And then in the morning, I go out and see what's in there. So I looked out in the morning one time and I saw this gigantic thing flapping around. I told my husband, oh my God, what is it? When I came out, it was catbird. So you birders will know that catbirds are buggers and there's nothing they like better than a fat, gel delicious moth. So this bird learned that she should stand by whenever the trap was out there. So what's the difference between uh, butterflies and moths? Well, one of the main things is moths have a feathery antenna, as you can see on the left, and a bigger body with, it looks like fur, but it's really scales. They're both in the order Lepidoptera, which means scaled wings. So if you ever found a butterfly or a moth and you rubbed its wings and powder comes off, not powder, it's scales. So on the right, you'll see uh, the monarch, which has club antenna, the smooth antenna, and a thin slender body. Because butterflies can rest in the hot sun to warm up. Moths can't, they need to be furred up. What's the difference in resting wing position? Well, Butterflies rest with their, you can try this at home. Butterflies rest with their wings up, everybody. Moths, wings down, good. Butterflies, <whistles> moths, <whistles> butterflies, <whistles> moths, up. Yep, we get the picture. So if you see an insect with big wings folded up like this during the daytime, it's a pretty good chance it's a butterfly. And here's a pro tip. Butterfly, the letter B starts at the top of the alphabet. So that's how you can remember butterflies up, moths down. So I love this monarch and I love the shadow there. That's in my driveway. The monarch was slurping up some minerals and below it is a male Cecropia moth. Yeah, with the wings down, of course. So the life cycle of a moth is fascinating. It's metamorphosis, I'm sure you're familiar with it. But it's very unique in any uh, kingdom. So it's an adult, lays an egg, and most of the life cycle, as you can see, is spent as a caterpillar, right? And each time the caterpillar grows, it morphs into another size and shape and color, and then it's called an instar. So this, uh, the silk moth has seven instars. Most moths have about five. And another pro tip is moth has the letter O, and cocoon has O's, right? So you can always remember moths build cocoons to make their transformation, right? And uh, butterflies build chrysalises. And that's my Twitter name, chrysalis. So caterpillars are called instars. That's another little insider lepidoptera <laughs> word that you like. So they're, you know, the hungry little caterpillar story, that's all caterpillars do. Eat, molt, eat, molt, eat, molt until it's time to build a cocoon. So on the left, you'll see a leopard moth laying her eggs. So moths can lay from 40 to 1,000 eggs at a time. That can be a problem. If you have a lot of wool in your house and you put your clothing away, it's not sparkling clean because the cloth moth will come and find a little spot where there's a little delicious snack, perhaps a little drop of cafe latte or something on the clothing. And that's where she'll lay her eggs so that her larva can eat that and then the rest of the wool. And they live for two years, so word to the wise. But um, the first instar here is in the center on the parsley to see that little caterpillar. So I have a friend that loves to go through the garden, and snap off a handful and, of herbs and pop it right in her mouth. And I said, you know, you might want to flip that over and just check and make sure that it's uh, free of caterpillars. And then who doesn't love a moth yearbook, right? Moths, um, the caterpillars just change shape so quickly, it's amazing. Ooh, here's, here's something you can see in the Wissahickon, the hickory horned devil. So up on the trail behind the tree house, uh, they often see this gigantic caterpillar. And of course it gets a bad, scary name, the hickory horned devil, but it is kind of amazing looking. And it creeps along and finds a place to go in the ground and build its cocoon. And then it emerges later in the spring as this magnificent royal moth. And then, you know, we have cleaned up the park and cleaned up the creek so that the habitat is fresh. And you may have heard uh, recently that we had a bear visiting the Wissahickon. So there's other kinds of bears too that turn into tigers. So you can see the woolly bear caterpillar. 
and there's a legend sort of like the groundhog you know that the, the woolly bear predicts the weather so the wider the the band in the center of the woolly bear caterpillar the milder the winter the shorter the band the more severe the winter and woolly bears turn into these very beautiful isabella tiger moths so love is in the air so back to our luna this luna is a male and that luna could find my luna that's on the rock you remember from down by uh, the hermit's cave because that luna the female would pump out her pheromones and if the male was up by the tree house by the Wisconsin environmental center at the top of our seven mile ribbon park he could follow her trail for six and a half miles if the wind is drifting in his direction now that is marvelous so some moths can also track a female for 30 miles right with its pheromones so ooh, here's one of my favorite moths the underwing i have a specimen here i just want to show you so they're famous because they fold their wings when they're of course when they're resting and then when something tries to get them and an attack comes like for example you can see a bat is trying to get them uh, they flash their terrible underwings to scare away the predators that this the color and the image is supposed to make them look uh, bigger and more terrifying they also do a cool thing they can jam sonar they make a little chirping sound and jam up the bats uh, at location as they as they come to them and they they can also do evasive maneuvers in the air like a kamikaze pilot you come to come to bat night you'll learn more about that but um they're quite remarkable and oh there's some another kind of moth that's remarkable is the sphinx moth and you may have seen this because people talk about it all the time um, this woman showed up at moth night with a beautiful sphinx tattoo on her leg and gave me permission to take that picture but a lot of times nocturnal creatures are demonized right so we have uh, this sphinx moth is called a death head moth because the back of the thorax has a pattern that looks a lot like a skull. So uh, Dracula mentions this. It's in uh, Edgar Allan Poe's story, The Sphinx. And of course, there's stories of Edgar Allan Poe floating down the Wissahickon Creek in a rowboat between the pubs back in the day. And then, of course, the most terrifying film ever made, The Silence of the Lambs, is about uh, it has the sphinx moth in it too so but sphinxes are lovely and you can see on the right um what they do is they're kind of like a little parakeet and they're they're fun to have at moth night because people like to hold them so if you put your finger the moth will step onto your finger and sit quietly so here's my friend moya with a sphinx moth she's going to pick that up yeah Ooh, and how do we attract moths? Well, we don't attract moths with one of these, right? Because they fly up at the canopy, top of the canopy, the way those big tiger swallowtails fly. You often see them flying up there. This won't really work at night. So we lure moths uh, with light and with pheromone bait. So there's two different kinds of light lures. There's a UV light lure that we light on sheets, a sheet lure. You see the picture at the bottom that was from Cobbs Creek Environmental Center. Hang the sheets and then get clips and shine um, ultraviolet light on them. Because the ultraviolet light lures the moths because it's almost identical to the frequency of reflected light of the moon, more identical than incandescent. And I also, also use uh, mercury vapor light which is even stronger that lures the light attracted uh, moths. There's another class of moths, remember our underwings? They are not attracted, they want to, oh, they're attracted to light, but they also will come to sugar bait. So I have a delicious secret recipe that I might share. <laughs> I mix it up, let me show you this. Oh, wait, first let's look at the sphinx. So here's one of these sphinxes on someone's shoe. And you know how Michael Phelps would like, you know, wing his arms around and get ready when he was getting ready to swim. He was our, a swimming champion. Well, the Sphinx is doing the same thing because their body is so heavy. They have to pump their wings to get ready to fly. So he's getting ready to go right there. And um, 
here I am with one of our friends just showing him showing her up close who's coming to the sheet lure which is uh, one of the fun lures that we have and this is down at Penn we said had did a bio blitz so I, I took one of my uh, you, you can use a sheet or you can if it's freestanding area you can use a um, like a slideshow screen so that's what I set up and, and also moths come near the near the light lure they don't have to go right on the, the sheet or the um, the, the part that you light. So I, I rolled out a, um, a shade, like a window shade on the ground so that we could see the moss that come close up. So the other, oh, here we go with the sugar bait. I knew this would happen. People love this. It smells delicious. So first you need bananas, brown sugar, and beer. It's a 3B sugar bait. Mix it together and let it ferment in the sun for a couple days. And then it becomes this irresistible smell that lures the male moths. It's a pheromone bioidentical smell. So I'm putting it on the, on the, uh, on the fence here, but the easier way to do it is to put it in big sheets on trees. And you know, when the sun sets, the temperature changes and there's a drift of wind. So I like to do the sailor's trick, right? And see which way the wind is going and then paint the trees just at shoulder level with patches of bait. So it helps the moths. So if they're downwind, they have a lot of choices and they can come up to the bait and then they nectar on it. And the way we sneak up on them is get a flashlight and put red cellophane over it. And you can crisscross the light over the uh, bark and that's a good way to find them. And then you won't startle them. You'll come to moth night and see. Oh, and then the moth trap. Well, on the right, you can see it's a box and then underneath is a contraption that I built. Um, these are the, you can go online and look for directions or I'm gonna make a splainer video about this, but it's made with things in your garage, except for the mercury va vapor and maybe the electrical socket. But I put um, egg cartons inside. So the moths are lured by the light and then they get confused and fall into the trap. And then we can open and see who's in there. And here we have the egg cartons. You can see some of the moss. They go in the crevices just like on a tree. They would go in the crevice of the bark of a tree. So here we have a beautiful, um, another Isabella tiger. And we use our um, ID books. And this is another sphinx moth. And it's a lot of fun. So I would want, invite you to be a steward of the land that you enjoy. If you like coming to the park, please come and find a way to volunteer if you want. And we're starting our Leave No Trace um, policy in the Wissahickon, which is, of course, you wouldn't harvest, you know, mushrooms, insects, plants, or take anything from the park, right? If you want to plant some native plants in your garden, we would love that. And uh, you could vote for people that are protecting the environment. And if you can come to Moth Night this year, that'll be great. I'm going to make a video about it, though, because I don't know if we're going to hold it. But thank you for joining us, and uh, thank you for coming. <laughs>